Could you tell us something about your role in a case like this? My background is, is, is mental health um, social work, um, but for the purposes of this case study, it's probably good to put it in context that the person in this role could either come from a nursing background or a social work background. Um, there's two aspects really to this case where, where I might get involved as a mental health social worker. That would be the initial assessment at A&E, after which um, Sandra was um, admitted to hospital under the Mental Health Act, because my role there would be, um, if I'm suitably trained as an approved mental health practitioner, where I'd be responsible for conducting, along with two doctors, the assessment under the Mental Health Act. So clearly a social worker could have a very key role in the initial admission to hospital um, under the Act. Um, up until quite recently, up until the 2007 Mental Health Act amendments, that was a role that could only be done by social workers, but it's now been opened out to other mental health professionals. Um, so you can, for example, get mental health nurses now also um, taking on that role. So I could get involved very early on, and it could be quite a short-term involvement where I go over to A&E, I meet with a psychiatrist and another doctor, um, I'm responsible for sort of organising the assessment. Um, in this case, she was actually sectioned, so I would be the person making the application based on medical recommendations. And following that, I would have a role in getting her a hospital bed, um, checking with the doctors that there's a bed available on the psychiatric ward, and uh, it would be my responsibility to convey her usually using um, ambulance um, to get her to that ward. If there's any kind of issues around safety, either for her or anyone else, the police would be involved as well um, to, to, to sort of escort us and to, to sort of man help me manage the situation. And once the person is admitted into hospital, I do a handover to the medical staff or to, to the psychiatric staff, and that could be the end of my involvement at that stage. I'd, I'd write up a report and that would be filed for future people who wanted to sort of refer to that, but my, my role would be pretty much finished. So Steve, what would your role be with Sandra when she goes home from hospital? when she's discharged from the mental health unit? I'd, I'd be going in there, doing, a, doing some kind of initial assessment, um, putting some kind of support plan together for her when she's discharged, um, and then basically working with her after she's discharged in the community to try and prevent um, her becoming acutely unwell again. It would be looking at the more long-term needs in terms of what does she want to do about her alcohol use? Does she want to try and stop? Does she want to try and manage the risks better? Um, are we into harm minimisation, that sort of thing. So I'd be involved in putting a care package together for her sort of ongoing support needs when she, when she leaves hospital. Part of that assessment, it, it's important that that's a kind of a holistic assessment that looks at not just her but her, the context of her family. I mean, I understand she's got children mm -hmm. there may be some issues around risk, domestic violence, that sort of thing. So it hasn't already been picked up and other referrals made I'd certainly be looking at those risks and deciding if we need to follow that up by referring this on to another team. For example, if we do feel there's ongoing child protection issues because of the domestic violence, then it may be myself um, that makes that referral following my assessment. This may have been picked up earlier on while she was an inpatient anyway, um, given the nature of how things were breaking down for her. So there is that role as well. Um, Depends, in terms of how long I'd be involved, really very much depends on how things progress. Um, if things stabilise and things start to get, she starts to get back on top of things in her life, the risks around the children, domestic violence seem to be subsiding, and it could be that it's not a particularly long-term involvement. And what might happen then is she may go back to, say, outpatients with a psychiatrist or someone like that. He or she may be sort of keeping an eye on things, mm. keeping an eye on medication and things like that. And would Sandra have to be giving consent for this? I mean, clearly we, we can't force Sandra to accept our support. So, I mean, I think part of, of how you try and work in this situation is to engage with her, to, to help her recognise that, yes, we're not there to force support on her, but that actually without support things may deteriorate again and, and the risks to herself and to her health and maybe family members may, may go up. Mm. And, you know... If, for example, there are concerns around the children um, and she's refusing to engage with services, you know, that would make an effect on how social services would then view that. And clearly the child protection side of social work would, would be a, a, involved in a far more assertive way if she was refusing support for herself. Because 
I guess there's probably an argument here that many of the risks are to do with her health. So if she's doing things around her drinking and her health to try and manage that, that in turn release, um, reduces the risk to other family members. If she's refusing that, it may have a knock-on effect. So I think it's important that we work with people at the, at the end of the day, not trying to force ourselves on them, but to give them a realistic understanding of what may happen if they don't get the support that they need.